biology and biomes and things like that. I'm not a scientist. I'm a gardener. I'm not a great gardener. I'm a master gardener for 10 years. Doesn't make me a great gardener, but I am, uh, I, I haul lots, I water lots of plants. I haul loads, pick up loads of compost and I put it on my plants. I pull the weeds out and keep the garden a little bit clean at some places better than others. And um, I bring in food for the plants and they still have not been thriving. And I ask myself, why? I'm doing all this work. Why don't I have an abundant, gorgeous garden? I don't. My friends will vouch. But um, so I started uh, about three years ago, I happened upon a talk by David Johnson. Dr. David Johnson was from Arizona. He's now an associate professor at CSUC Regenerative Ag Department, which is an enormous resource for our community. And uh, he did, a, he had a talk about fungal dominant composting and the impact it was having on agriculture and on um, and much wider impacts as well, which we'll talk about at the end. So I started looking at this, looking into this and reading and looking at all the clips and videotapes that they have available at the Regenerative Ag site, which is phenomenal. And uh, I just developed a passion for it that wanted to spill out to you folks. So I'm hoping that at the end of this, you'll have some of the same reaction. You'll feel empowered to make some shifts and will also want to pass some of this on. Um, I do have one, this, one alert for you. Some of the things that I might say might be different than what you've been doing. And um, I ask you to keep an open mind and take a look and read and look into the research. So why am I doing it now? It's amazing how many people I know who have gotten various kinds of diseases, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, that said now that there used to be a hundred, uh, one in a hundred people got cancer. Now it's one in two, and that, that is rising. Cancer is the number one killer for dogs. And one of the people that I've been uh, very much enthralled with is Dr. Christine Jones, who, uh, melds uh, soil science, soil ecology, and uh, nutrient and what's going on globally in the planet. Um, and she says that the big break in cancer prevention will be in changing the way we produce food. So some of the challenges that are happening uh, on a wide scale in the world right now are that and this would be no uh, this is no secret for those of you that stayed in Chico this summer uh, temperatures are rising we are experiencing the effects of global warming we're losing topsoil since the beginning uh, since the plow was invented we've been losing topsoil some soil scientists say that they have, we have 60 years of topsoil left. Think of the implications of that. Topsoil is where plants grow. That's where food is made. 60 years of it left at the current rate of the practices uh, of farming right now. Um, we're experiencing desertification uh, in many areas of our farming community and over the world. This is, the, this is that our soils are not holding on to the water when it rains and the soils don't have the capacity to keep that water down where it can be accessed by uh, plant tissue. Um, the plowing and the turning of the soil has put more and more carbon into the atmosphere. This is the greenhouse effect where we're, um, where carbon is going up into the air instead of held in the ground where it belongs. So there are three things that can help with this situation. Oh yeah, I wanted to say back here, um, 
I, if any of you have uh, pressed your mute button and decided to go do something cheerier, let me tell you that there is a solution and there are things that we can do about this. And there are three principles that are, well, I'm going to talk about in the next three weeks that um, apply. The first one in the source and the um, topic of this day's conversation is to minimize disruption. Next week, I'll be talking about keeping root, live roots in the soil and not having any bare soil and the various kinds of um, inputs that you can use, the different kinds of composts and what they offer. Um, and the third part in the third week will be diversity, which is having a number of plants uh, working together. And we'll talk about why that's important just very briefly, and I'll go into it more in the third week. And after that, um, someone is going to be talking about uh, companion planting, which totally plays into the plant diversity bit. Okay, traditional gardening, what's it been doing? First of all, the plow and turning the soil, and that includes uh, what we used to do and what I certainly did when I was building my beds, is double digging the soil or turning the soil over during, between crops and uh, plowing it uh, under to get rid of weeds and um, make it fluffy for the next crop. Uh, plowing the soil has been one of the big culprits here. The other the traditional farming uh, is, does um, many times a year will plow the fields. Um, they also fertilize the, the flush that they get when they turn the soil over is short lived and in order to keep the plants growing, they need to add fertilizer at great costs. They control the weeds with herbicides because in your garden at home, you can go out and pick the aphids off the roses, or you can go and spray or spray them. You can go out and with a little bowl of soapy water and knock the squash bugs off the um, off the yellow squash and smash some uh, eggs if you're brave and don't mind doing that. And you can actually get a heads up on the uh, critters. But if you have like acres, like 500,000 acres or something, you're not gonna be able to do that. And you will have to resort to something else if you want to, if you want to get rid of your weeds. So they use herbicides. Um, and the other, then if they have an infestation of pests and which are likely in monocrops grown in fertilized soil, they will use pesticides and for fungal treatment, treatments, of course, there are fungicides. But what's the effect on the plants? In order to know that, we have to figure out how do plants work. And here you go for the science part, guys. So you all, all are familiar with photosynthesis, and um, I am familiar with photosynthesis, but always need to have a reminder. So, this is an amazing process. Plants don't get the, what they need from the ground. You, they get what they they can get what they need from the air. Photosynthesis is the process by which they take carbon dioxide, which is in the air in small amounts, like 0.04 percent, uh, and uh, and water. And, it, and in the presence of sunlight, they make it into sugars and oxygen. So the oxygen is taken, is, uh, you know, taken apart from the CO2 and the HDO and it jets off into the air. The sugars go down the plant into the roots and they create this um, exudate of sugars on the sheath of the roots. Um, there's this phenomenal uh, thing called the liquid carbon pathway, and this is the way that that carbon dioxide in the air is taken in by the plant, processed, and with the help of the microbial life in the soil, is turned into soil humus. And we'll talk about that more later. Very important and interesting. 
So why is putting carbon in the soil so important? Um, well, what happens when the, when the um, sugars are in the, on the roots of the plants and exuded in this kind of like um, syrupy stuff around them is that it draws microbes that migrate over to the plants. This in turn pulls fungi who feed on the microbes and other things. And uh, they and these bacteria and fungi together are the plus some other soil organisms have the ability to take nutrients, micronutrients, and trace elements in the soil and make them in a bioavailable uh, way to the plant. Plants can't take the nitrogen directly and put it. Uh, into a plant, and um, they 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 actually you do better if they have this extra help by the basically the poop of these organisms, which makes the um, trace elements and the uh, trace minerals and the elements available to them. Carbon is also necessary to build soil structure. Now, this was a concept that I had to wrap my head around rather recently. It's soil aggregates. Um, that apparently, there are, are ways for the soil to be able to trap water and moisture and make little homes for these critters. And there are ways where it doesn't work very well. And I'll have a demonstration later to show you something about that. The effects of uh, plowing and digging. It releases the nitrogen very quickly, but it doesn't, but the nitrogen is not in a form in the ground where it's going to stay there. And you may have, I'm sure many of you are aware of the impacts of nitrogen rolling off the soil. It's very uh, water soluble at this, in this condition. And it rolls off the land and into the streams and down into the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, in other countries, it rolls off into the Great Coral Reef. And uh, Christine um, Jones said that when she was a child, she could actually walk uh, from the beach out to see the coral reefs and play in them. Now, in order to see the Great Barrier Reef and experience that um, amazing uh, biological climate, you have to take a jet ski for an hour and a half. The coral, great coral reef is dying at a very swift rate, and it's due to the uh, nitrogens and uh, things that are being released from people on the land into the water. Uh, and as we said, it's, uh, it's jetting the carbon into the air, which uh, contributes to uh, global warming. Uh, loss of the topsoil, we have said, is uh, moving at a fairly swift pace now through wind and erosion. We are losing topsoil. And the other thing that you may, you would actually experience in your own gardens if you use a rototiller, is that when it's fluffing up the, um, when it's fluffing up the, I gotta have hands sometimes, you guys. So it fluffs up the soil. At, at the same time, those tines, when they hit the bottom, they are compacting the soil, just exactly the thing that you don't want. That layer of compaction creates a, 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 makes it more difficult for water to penetrate, and it makes it more difficult for roots to penetrate. And the big thing that we're going to talk about today is whenever you're using one of those machines or your shovel and you're turning the soil over and banging it on the head, you are slicing, dicing and pulverizing the soil microbes. You're killing them, guys. So why, I'm gonna talk a little bit about inorganic fertilizers. So um, these are the miracle grows and the NPKs that you can apply to your soil. And it looks, the reason people use them is because it looks like the plants are growing so much faster and they have blossoms and they look good, they're green. But what happens is the plant gets lazy. A plant that's growing with um, uh, some of these uh, added fertilizers 
doesn't have to do the work of making the sh taking the sugars down to its roots and exuding them uh, for to bring in the microbes and the fungi. And so, and when they don't bring in uh, those things, then they're not able to take up the micronutrients and make it part of their plant tissue. Um, one of the things that happens with the micronutrients, and it happens with people too, is that, um, that the plant's um, disease resistance is, uh, is parallel to its ability to put sugars into its tissue. And when, when it's not doing that, the plant has less disease resistance. It's also less able to um, respond to and uh, not be as tasty to insects. And the third thing that's important for us is that it really, really affects the nutrient density of our food. Um, I know a lot of you out there go to the grocery store and you're buying organic food and that feels a lot better and it is better. But I have to tell you that organic doesn't mean nutrient dense anymore. Organic can be, you can grow organic and do all of the guidelines and still not have the, new, this, the number of micronutrients and um, minerals and so on that you need for optimal health. And we're becoming uh, people who are overweight and undernourished. You can eat a lot of food, a lot of plant food even, that is not giving you the nutrition that you need. Uh, unless the soil is attended to. So the good news is we can fix it by minimizing disruption. Remember I told you that, uh, that tilling things up was rather like um, uh, uh, very chopping and dicing the microbes. Well, it's like putting a Hurricane Katrina through your soil. So how are we gonna fix it? One of the things we can do is instead of pulling the weeds and uh, pulling the weeds and the plants out and by the roots and, um, and uh, tossing them away, we can cut the, cut the plants off at the soil level and cut the weeds off at soil level and leave the roots in the soil. Even better, let them grow for a while and plant in between them. It will give a little microclimate to the new plants coming in. They won't have quite so much sun stress when they're babies. And they will also, they'll, you know, they'll give them a little bit of shade, a little bit of protection, a little bit of uh, temp thermal protection and uh, to get started. And then when they are uh, a little bit, maybe, you know, four inches high or something, then cut off the pet spent plants, but leave the roots in the soil. Don't use any organic fertilizers. I think we covered this part. Avoid herbicides and pesticides. <clears throat> we don't really like to see our garden with holes in the leaves and little critters walking around on the, on the leaves. The problem with pesticides is that they don't discern which bugs to kill. So if you're using a pesticide in your garden because you have an overgrowth of one kind of critter, uh, you are also taking out all of the, all of the um, insects uh, that may help you control that. Or, um, insect, that other bad insect. So uh, if you can avoid pesticides altogether, you're on better footing. And avoid herbicides. There was a time when it was thought that Roundup was like you were home free using Roundup. You could put it on, you could kill the weeds and not have to go over there and take care of them and uh, your garden would look nice and tidy. Um, and it would turn ultimately into, what was it? I don't know, something that was good. What was it, John? Nitrogen or something? I don't remember what Roundup turned into. But um, we're finding that that is not the case when it comes to microbial growth. Remember that plants in a given vicinity um, are 
they're a community. They're not just growing in isolation and they're borrowing other or organisms kind of travel back and forth and, and there's a whole network of conversations going on down there. And uh, you don't get, to, don't get a free pass when you're killing things uh, when it comes to the soil. Also, uh, some people who have gotten, get, get seeds that are treated with fungicide figuring they're just going to get the jump on not having fungal growth. But fungal growth is actually what we're looking for in the soil. So don't use seeds that are treated with fungicide. You're working against yourself. We'll talk about this more in a lot more detail, but mulch, what you do instead is mulch, mulch, mulch. Um, and to create a, a climate for the, um, I mean, let's see, is the next slide talking about mulch, John? Hold on a second. Uh, anyway, okay, so mulch, um, there are a lot of things that mulch, mulching will give you. It puts a, it's a, a carbon is available for the uh, creatures to take in and make uh, and put bring into the soil. Um, it, it's a thermal element. It will keep the soil. If if you have um, there's a uh, one of the experiments that they did was well, it wasn't an experiment. It was a farm that was next to a traditionally farmed farm. Regenerative ag farm on one side, traditionally farmed, farmed on the other side. And uh, it was a hot day. And they took a thermometer out to the fields on the traditionally farmed soil. Um, the temperature was 20 degrees hotter at the store. The soil was 20 degrees hotter than the soil on the um, regeneratively, regenerative ag side. And these were in exactly the same climate, same type of soil ultimately uh, to start with. Okay, so um, uh, there is a period where uh, you are, if you are in, in going to entertain using some of the regenerative ag pro processes for your own garden, there will be a transition period where um, you uh, you're cutting off the plants from their usual source of um, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, and you're going you're going to wait for the microorganisms to the plants have to especially if you've been using it for a while your plant roots will have to make an accommodation to start making these eggs and dates, and then the migration of the critters will have to come. Um, and to start off this process. The transition is the transition food is uh, compost tea or a foliar application or a root dench drench. And I'll talk a little bit more about that down the road. Um, oh, I wanted to show you what happens when what I'm talking about with the roots of the plants in this great rich humus with the mycorrhizae and the you know the fungi and the bacteria and so on and what happens when you're in a soil that doesn't have that kind of activity let me just give you a demonstration i pulled some of these out of Kay's garden i had to walk around a long time to find a weed Okay, so you, how, do we, how do we do this, John? You all may want to change to uh, what's called speaker view so that your screen is dominated by Cheryl and her demonstration. You can click up, at, usually on the right top of your screen, you can, you're probably in gallery view now. If you click on speaker view, you will um, see this demonstration more clearly. Okay, John, you, you may have to hold the hold the camera up. All right, there are my breasts. <laughs> That's not what we're after. <laughs> Let's see. I can How do I, this. I can, hold. I can do this. I can hold this up to the camera. Hold on, this is easier. Let me do this. Okay, I picked up two 
two pieces of spurge from Kay's garden this morning. I had to look for them. Uh, so here, here we have the roots of one big spurge plant. I don't know if you can see this. Let me we'll find out where I'm going to get away from here. So you can see the, this is kind of hard to see, John. I'll put it against my shirt. How do we do this? Put it against my where is, the, where is the camera? Right there. Okay, so you can see that these are pretty clean looking roots. This is what roots look like when they're in uh, soil that is not supporting the, um, this microbiome. And here's the same plant, spurge, that's in some of Kay's great soil. You can hardly see any of the roots because all the soil is held together by this vast network of little tiny, of, of, of a whole bunch of little roots that are in there. It's all holding the soil together. Let's see, I don't know. Can you see it? Yeah. So. Right up there, close to the okay. camera. All right. So, whoa. So you can see, you can just lift it up in the, and the, the soil is clinging um, to the roots. So that's what you see when, you, uh, when things are growing in great place. Um, there's one other thing that I wanted to show you, and that is, oh, I think this is, I'm gonna do it. Well, I'm gonna do this while my hands are dirty, John. Do it. Okay, so down the road, I wanted to show you this thing about what looks what uh, aggregated and non-aggregated soil looks like. Um, if you have soil that is a, a really nice, rich soil that makes a great climate for your stuff, you can squeeze it together and it, oh, this is not optimal, but okay, do I gotta find it? Okay. You can squeeze it together and when you release your hand, it just turns into like little, little tiny bits. Um, just kind of roll off like little pebbles of, of soil that are all kind of loosey-goosey. If you were to take soil that is um, non-aggregated, it's more like clumps and you can squeeze them, but they just kind of pulverize. And they, and, um, the other thing is, if they're, uh, if you wet them down, they just turn into like this, well, this has some clay in it. So it turns into like this um, globbed up mass Whereas the sea, the soil, the little water in here stays loose and aerated and easy for the roots to penetrate. Okay. Here are the hands getting rinsed off. There's a towel. All right. So do you want to get us back to the, I do. the other part, John? Thank you. I got to tell you guys, that works a lot better when it's in person. <laughs> Much more dramatic. Okay. Okay. Oops, I'm not going forward. Okay. It's not moving, John. Okay, so we did the roots with and without mycorrhizae, we did the aggregate test. So that's a that's actually one of the ways that you can go and take a look at your soil and um, test it out. Um, you just go pull some, pull up a weed and see is it, is it look like it's all clean roots? That's not good. If it looks like it comes up with a bunch of blobs of soil, 
um, and you have to bang it around to get the soil off, then that, me that means that you've got some uh, humus and soil aggregation going on. That's good. Okay, so we're going to do mulch, mulch, mulch instead of dig, dig, dig. Uh, in order to do this, you'll be laying on piles of compost. Um, and we'll talk about which all compost is not created equal, and we'll talk next week about different kinds of compost and what they offer. Um, I uh, I use cardboard a lot in my garden, and I get this from the, to uh, cover uh, the beds, especially if I'm making a new bed. Or um, I'll I'll use uh, cardboard because it lasts a little bit longer than newspapers. But uh, newspapers are good. Uh, you may have heard to use like three or four um, sheets of newspapers. I use about 10. And uh, the, often people say to lay the newspaper down and then water it. Um, I have done quite a bit of this and I think that I just get a big bucket and I throw the newspapers in there because then I don't have to worry about the wind whipping them around before I get to the hose and it just seems to go faster. And actually laying out the newspapers is not one of those jobs that I like, so I like it to go faster. On top of the newspapers, you'll put something that makes it look better. So straw, wood chips, whatever it is that you're using for the top layer of your mulch. Remember, this is going to be the thermal envelope. It's going to keep down the weeds and it's, uh, it keeps the sunlight off of the weeds, which makes them say, hey, time to grow. So you're keeping the sunlight off those weed seeds and um, keeping the moisture in the soil. Okay, so in the transition period, when you're trying to build your soil up and it's not there yet, your plants still need to have something to eat. So one of the solutions that they're proposing is compost tea. And compost tea is an aerobic solution that is uh, bubbled in a, like a five gallon bucket. You put, to, put uh, your uh, a bag of compost in a permeable sack um, uh, and uh, tie it up. And then you, with, you can add some seaweed extract, some humate, fish hydrolysate, uh, some molasses. Molasses will pr pr promote both bacterial and fungal growth. Um, and you bubble this for like 24 to 48 hours to allow these microorganisms and fungi to proliferate in the uh, brew. Uh, you use this then as a spray to spray on the leaves of your plant. Now, the plants can take up food from their leaves or you can use it as a soil drench. Now, when you're using compost tea as a soil drench, it's not the same thing as totally watering the plant with compost tea. In, in just a small amount of this brew, there are like billions of organisms. Um, in a teaspoon of, uh, of, a night of, of good compost, you might have 75,000 uh, species of bacteria and yards and yards and yards of fungi. So this is a very uh, uh, concentrated way of getting critters to your plants. Now, I have to say also, when I was trying to figure out what to say to you on this um, transmission, um, I was confused because some people, my great buddy, um, Christine Jones among them would say that you don't ordinarily you don't need to add a whole bunch of stuff to soil because it's all there and uh, the spores of, um, of fungi are existing in the soil and given the right climate they'll just proliferate as will bacteria so she would be she would say that if you ha if you don't have terrible terrible soil if you're not like bringing up bringing up 
up from the bottom of an estuary or importing sands from Arabia or something, then you already have the biology in your soil. And if you give them the right conditions, they will grow. So that being said, if you want to give them a jump start and you don't have the right conditions, you might want to use some compost tea. The other thing I'm thinking is that uh, the inhibitory effect of uh, traditional fertilizing um, might be overcome better and faster by using some compost tea because there is an inhibitory effect that is going on. We have a couple notes here. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yes. That's good, John. Thank you. So I have on another computer the notes that do not appear on this screen. So I'm John is alerting me, I might be missing something. So one of the things is about city water. Many of you are living in the city and city water is treated so that it doesn't have unfortunate organisms growing in it that, that will make you sick. But those, that treatment is also getting in the way of the good organisms that you want to grow in your compost tea. So in order to get so to deal with the chlorine or possibly the chloramine that's in the uh, city water uh, let it uh, percolate for two hours before you add your compost and these other things two hours or 24 no you to to deal with okay. the chlorine you can uh, percolate it aerate it for two hours or let it sit in the bucket without aeration for 24 hours and that will let the chlorine dissipate from the water and it won't be killing your organisms just when you're trying to grow them. So uh, bear in mind that these critters are growing very, very fast. So bacterium, I mean, some of them grow like right before your eyes can just go and duplicate like crazy. Some of them take maybe 12 minutes to duplicate, but they can die just as fast. So you need to make your conditions not, not uh, like not scorched. Don't leave it out in the sun to per bubble in the sun, put it in the shade and um, you'll bubble this area. Debt. You can use a, um, oh, it's very cheap. Those, uh, those little bubblers that they use to aerate fish tanks, they're very inexpensive. You just plug that in and let it bubble away for, 24 to 48 hours, uh, and then use this in a sprayer on your plants. Um, oh, one other caveat is they are organisms that like a particular kind of thing. They've, you've kept them in a warm, uh, but not too hot place. And you don't want to uh, take them out and apply them to soil that's baking in the sun in the sun at uh, 90 or 100 degrees or something. So put them, apply them to the soil when the soil is kind of about the same temperature as the bubbling liquid that you have. Um, now, back to Christine Jones, she would say that and. Uh, and she has noticed actually that if you, your soil is deficient in the organisms, you will see an increase in the production of your crop or your, your, the, the healthiness of your plants. If your soil is already rich in things, you won't see anything. It's not going to give you an extra boost. If it's already there, it's not going to help. It's already there. So, um, so I'm stuck. Oh, there it is. Now, so uh, David Johnson, he, the, this is back to the guy that uh, was applying a fungal rich compost to his fields and finding uh, outrageously great results of uh, like growing three times better or something. So um, he has demonstrated, do people see me? Because yes. I'm not seeing. Okay, I'm not seeing me anymore. So. Yes, I'm seeing you. Okay. okay. So, um, so he, he has made the point that um, that uh, the gardens will do better with a one-to-one -one ratio, optimally one-to-one -one ratio of fungi to bacteria. Most gardens are way higher in bacteria than they are in fungi, and um, uh, 
your compost heap, your home compost, if you have one, is probably bacterial dominant. In order to make a fungal dominant uh, compost, you need to switch a few things, and I'll talk about that next week. Oops, okay. Um, but there is a fix. So if you need a fungal, if you want to make this compost tea and make it fungal dominant to write the balance between the bacteria and the fungi, you can make a fungal rich compost. And unlike David Johnson's compost, which actually takes a year to make, you can make a fungal rich compost, just a little pile of it in a week. So the way to do this is you take some compost that you have someplace, whatever compost you have, and uh, hopefully a good quality compost, but um, you mix it with one part oatmeal or fish hydrosylate. I don't think I spelled that right, but never mind. Um, uh, you have it kind of damp, like a nice compost damp, and you store it in a warm, dark place for one week. Uh, you may see the little white filaments growing in it at the end of that week and then take this compost and put it in your bag to make to use as the compost for compost tea and you will be making a uh, fungal bacterial uh, balanced uh, drench for your plants. Uh, testing your soil. There is a problem with soil tests. So if you've had a soil test done, um, that is not going to really give you a great view of what's really available to your plants. The problem with soil tests is that they're testing the elements or the minerals, but the, and, the, and the soil itself is actually uh, using organisms. So you're missing 97% of what's going on in the soil when you do this um, a, a soil test. So the better thing is what we've done before, check out your roots, squeeze a handful and see what the aggregation of your soil is. And uh, you might try a BRICS test which measures the sugars in your plant. Sugars, remember, correlate to uh, having a good nitrogen and uh, good in, in your plants. And um, there's a test called the BRICS test, which I'm not gonna go into very much right now. But uh, if you have a high BRICS test on your plant, it's kind of, you pulverize the leaves and you uh, and look through them in an, on a water solution and see what the color is. And the BRICS test over 12, which is a higher BRICS test, will give you plants that are very resistant to insects and to pathogens. Uh, in, the, in the next few weeks, we're going to talk about keeping live roots in the soil and uh, diversity. Um, just as a re review, do a quick review we've got uh, of the things that were... Um, what, should I take some questions right now or just... No, there haven't been very many, so you can... Okay, good. Okay. So, Remember, uh, to build your soil, you keep the roots in there, mulch it like crazy, build, plant in between the ones that you're taking out, plant a lot of different plants. Different plants bring different things to the table. So for, for example, I've got a whole field of plantain where I live. Well, I look at that field and I say, hmm, plantain. That's because my soil is low in calcium. Well, plantain is a very is a deep rooted plant, and it pulls calcium up from the soil. So those plant those plantain weeds are kind of treating my soil right now. As they break down, they will they will release the calcium to a higher level. So, um, but but it's not a great thing that it's almost all plantain. If it were more diverse, I'd have more kind of different uh, elements coming into the soil. That's not a very uh, fertile area. And then limit the dis disturbance that you are making with your applications and your shovel. We talked about using in the transition and uh, that's duplication. Okay, there's another thing. 
that will happen as you mo move down this path, you'll have to develop a tolerance for a different aesthetic. This is a garden that looks very tidy and clean. The plants are in rows and they're, they're buddied up with plants just like them. This is a plant that has a, a, a diver, diverse number of plants that are uh, grown, thrown all together. And the, the, the difference in the aesthetic is gardens will look messier uh, than traditional gardens when you go down this road. So it takes uh, some getting used to. So the goal of all of this, in addition to the organisms, is you're gonna be building humus. Humus is 60% carbon and six to 8% nitrogen. It has phosphorus, sulfur, and other minerals in it. Unlike the uh, nitrogen that, uh, and humus doesn't break down. Once, once these, uh, all this microbiome stuff has converted things into humus, it is a stable compound. It's kind of like a tree is a tree. It's not like you can't break a tree into tannic acid and something or else, something else. Humus is a real thing and it holds onto the carbon. It holds and, and it is, and the nitrogen does not leach out. It will not, when you water a field that has high humus, you're not gonna get a bunch of nitrogen rolling down into the rivers. Uh, it doesn't break down and it doesn't degrade. It stays there for a very, very long time. So it, you, once you build it, you are on more stable footing. You have less work to do in the future to be a good gardener. Uh, and it also has a, a like 70% greater water holding capacity and it makes little nooks and crannies for all of those creatures that are feeding your plants. So uh, the other thing about the humate in the soil is it's a really good substrate for if you're on city water for dealing with the chloramine or the chlorine that is coming from your water, it can detoxify those things. Um, so with healthy, healthy uh, soil, you'll lose, use less water, you'll save money on herbicides and pesticides, you get a wide, much wider range of nutrients in the foods that you are growing for your own consumption. Um, there was a statistic that, um, or a fact that came out that was related to Alzheimer's and it said that the, uh, well, oh, one of the things that, uh, that um, some of the fungi are good at is taking, let's see, wait a minute, degraded soil releases aluminum. I don't know why, but it does. So it makes it aluminum more free floating. And uh, Alzheimer's patients have been uh, tested and come out very high in aluminum in their blood. So put that someplace. I just thought it was interesting. And um, anyway, you'll get a, uh, de soils can detoxify uh, heavy metals and uh, be a treatment for what ails us. Uh, reduces the carbon in the atmosphere. And from where I was starting with my poor garden and how much work it was, I would get less work, less money going into it, less water use, better food, and better flowers. The big benefit for all of us is that this kind of switch can uh, reduce or halt climate change. Dr. David Johnston said by, by his calculations, if 14% of the uh, farms were to switch over to um, regenerative ag, it would halt climate change. So we can each do our own part to make our own micro environment a part of the solution. This is a fact sheet that I'm attaching to the PowerPoint. And uh, let's see, do, do, I, do you have a question for me? Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Okay, I'm going to do questions and, and just attach this to the PowerPoint. Uh, 
So uh, two people have questions about uh, compost tea. One is whether you use compost on your plants, on your potted, or what, on potted plants especially. That's from Anna. And Laura also asks, how much water do you use when making compost tea? Oh, you put, uh, you fill a five gallon bucket with, uh, with water. And I didn't actually put the, the, um, the specifics of how much of which kind of thing. I will uh, attach it, I will put it into the PowerPoint before the PowerPoint is sent out to you. But let me make a little, uh, a little comment about that. Um, if you look up compost tea, you don't get one recipe on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> there are all kinds of things and I just kind of look at it like I'm, I'm not a perfectionist so I just look at it and giving them something it's like it's like make a smorgasbord for your for things and they'll take what they want you can't say I'm gonna have exactly one teaspoon of this and exactly three quarters of a cup of that because it doesn't really matter it's all going to go into the same place and the microbes will take what they need. The other thing is a whole bunch of it is going to go no place because the bacteria, especially if you have a lot of bacteria and fungi in your soil already, they just take the stuff apart. They just, it, they just wipe it out. They don't need it. It's like a competing kind of thing for them. But if you're deficit in it, it'll definitely make a difference. And yes, you can definitely use it on potted plants. Great, and another question from Cornelia with regards to pulling weed roots instead of um, chopping them off. She says, uh, if the weed is perennial and invasive, there's no reason not to pull the roots, correct? The, this is another thing that is, um, is, has mixed stories in the literature. Um, so uh, there's a one of the gardeners that does a lot of stuff, farmers market stuff and so on in Chico. He lets Bermuda grass grow in his um, among his perennials and uh, and uh, vegetables, and he says that it's really not a problem because they basically shade it out largely, so it uh, it doesn't really get a a big um, head, of, uh, you know, it doesn't take over. Uh, he might pull off the top of it, but he doesn't dig out all the roots. Be aware that when you're digging down to get Bermuda grass out of your garden, what are you doing to the rest of the stuff that's down there? So I'm a mixed bag, uh, a mixed set on this one. What I do in my own garden is I, put, I just break the tops of the Bermuda grass off and if there's something right on the surface, I'll lift it off. But I don't go digging down because it's too much destruction to do that. I take five, 10 layers of newspaper and I just slap it right over the Bermuda grass so that it doesn't have the sun to get going. So largely even perennials can be treated by uh, heavy, uh, by cutting off the top, maybe just below the, uh, l the soil area and heavily, heavily mulching that point so they don't have any uh, sun to get going. And there was an earlier question about glyphosate uh, and we might want to put on a whole workshop sometime about Roundup and glyphosate. This question was, how can I get rid of um, really stubborn invasives. In this case, she was asking about wisteria, if I don't use glyphosate. Um, I did a little research just now and, and can address that okay. quickly unless you yeah. have a quick go ahead, answer. Go ahead. So um, if you yeah, haven't looked at them yet, do be aware of the uh, Master Gardener and UC Extension pest notes. Uh, there's not a pest note that specifically addresses wisteria as uh, an invasive, although it, it is. Um, this article that I did find said you can cut off wisteria and treat it, especially if you treat the stump area, by cutting into the stump away and with um, basically any herbicide, including stump killers, uh, rather than glyphosate. And you see in the scientific uh, uh, community is getting more and more evidence that glyphosate does build up in the soil, that it is a carcinogen, and if we can avoid its use, um, we should. In fact, the University of California has uh, uh, outlawed, essentially restricted its use. It's not allowed to be used on any uh, 
um, University of California, and by extension, uh, Master Gardener Demonstration Gardens and so forth. So um, that's the brief answer on that. And obviously, there's online research you can do for that also. I, I want to say that um, I, I, I have actually had some success with getting rid of Elianthus even by which I don't know if any of you know that every time there's a you cut something off it the roots just proliferate and send off more stuff but I've actually managed to pretty much limit that by just being persistently taking off all the vegetation and eventually the roots kind of get exhausted that's the same thing with Bermuda I imagine it might work with wisteria okay we have a couple more questions Margaret asks whether uh, regenerative agricultural practices deal with the spread of aphids, beetles, hornworms, etc. Uh, is there a relationship between these practices and actually the spread of, I assume, um, unwanted pests? Yeah, there is, of course. If you have a plant that's getting all the stuff that it needs, well, there's a fascinating thing that happens with plants. When they are under attack by a certain insect, they actually send out chemical messages that say, bring me something, I'm under attack here. The fungi understand the message and, the, and bring them whatever seems to work for them. And the plant can then build into its tissue some defense against that uh, predator or that, that feeder. Um, they also, because all the mycorrhizae are going out into the soil, they will tell that through the mycorrhizal channels, they can tell the other plants, hey, this guy's being attacked by, I don't know, what kind of bug did they say? Aphids or beetles or beetles, beetles, beetles. So um, you might want to think about uh, getting some protection and those plants will become more resistant. So the thing about this is kind of like the, the aesthetics with uh, regenerative ag, you have to relax your standards a bit. So some, um, some pests, if you tolerate them, uh, they become the food for something else or they become the signal that, you, that a, a chemical reaction needs to happen to protect the plant. It doesn't happen as fast as, uh, as pesticides, so it takes some getting used to. And then uh, we have a comment from Barbara uh, who says, who reminds us that... Um, oh, I want to say one other thing. Sure. Okay, if you have a lot of pest damage, it's because your soil is out of balance. It's not, it, so, so attend to the soil. If you're seeing a lot of insect damage, attend to your soil. Good. Uh, Barbara wants to remind us that uh, many native bee species need bare soil for nesting so that if you can find places uh, not to mulch heavily, um, that can help uh, native bees thrive. Okay, that's a good point. And um, I've never seen a garden that wasn't, that was mulched everywhere all the time. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen one. I've never seen it. <laughs> and then uh, Jean asks, do you put cardboard down now and then and punch holes in it for spring planting when you're doing sh uh, sheep mulching? Oh yeah, well yeah, sure. Whenever you're wanting to plant something else, you throw down, throw down some compost, throw down a cardboard, cut a little hole in it, plant your se seeds, uh, mulch on top of it, and you're good to go. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, guys. You got many thank yous and uh, congratulations and uh, nice comments. We'll review those after the fact. Thank you everybody for being with us. Uh, look for our other online workshops. Uh, don't hesitate to send us a comment if you have uh, comments about how this went, um, along when you return your evaluations, which you'll be receiving soon in the email. Thank you everybody, uh, we'll close now. Thank you. Bye-bye. It was a... Uh... Huh.